As I mentioned in a previous video in this series where I look at some of the original stories by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster to feature the character, Superman has a long and proud history of social activism. In his earliest incarnation, he was an unabashed champion of the people, an enemy of corporate and political corruption, an ally of labor, and a dedicated crusader against injustice in all its forms. You might also recall from the very first video in this series that my favorite version of Superman is the one presented in the animated shorts produced by Fleischer Studios in the early 1940s. So, with those two bits of information in mind, you can probably guess how I feel about Gene Lewin Yang and Gurihiro's miniseries Superman Smashes the Clan, which was first published by DC Comics in 2019. If you don't feel comfortable hazarding a guess, just sit tight, because I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about Superman Smashes the Clan, and I expect my feelings about it will be quite apparent. But if you can't even wait that long to find out, I'll just go ahead and tell you up front. I think it's fantastic. Superman Smashes the Clan is the story of young Roberta Lee, who moves to the suburbs of Metropolis with her family after her father gets a new job with the Metropolis Health Department. It's 1946, and the Lees, Roberta, her older brother Tommy, and their parents, Dr. and Mrs. Lee, are Chinese-American. They've moved to the suburbs from Chinatown, and this is the first time Roberta and Tommy have ever lived someplace where most of their neighbors and peers are not also Chinese. Life in the suburbs brings opportunities, Dr. Lee's job, a new group of friends for Roberta and Tommy, including their across-the-street neighbor, Jimmy Olsen, but there is also the challenge of the racism and xenophobia directed at the Lees by some of the white people in their community. This prejudice is at its most obvious and dangerous when it comes in the form of the local hate group, the Clan of the Fiery Cross. While the Lees are threatened by bigots who treat them as unwelcome aliens, Superman is dealing with his own insecurity about his origins, feelings which are brought to the surface after Superman is exposed to kryptonite for the first time following a fight with Atom Man, who is sort of a Nazi version of Metallo. The kryptonite not only renders Superman temporarily weakened, it also triggers unsettling hallucinations, where Superman's own body appears to be that of an extraterrestrial, green-skinned, bug-eyed with antennae sticking out of his forehead. Additionally, Superman begins experiencing visions of his Kryptonian parents, who appear in the same green-skinned alien form. The Superman of this story is in the early days of his superhero career. When the story begins, he's still mostly in the dark about his origins. He doesn't know about Krypton, and he hasn't yet manifested all of his powers. Most significantly, he can't fly. He runs, traveling through Metropolis by racing across the power lines. When his alien parents realize that he isn't living up to his superpowered potential, they observe that it's as if he's afraid like he only wants to be half of who he actually is. The stories of Superman and the Lees intersect after the Clan of the Fiery Cross stages a cross burning on the Lees front lawn. The next morning, Clark Kent and Lois Lane arrive on the scene to write a story about the incident and have a chat with Roberta. I always kind of suspected that I don't belong, Roberta says. Last night we got proof. Given his recent hallucinations and visions of his alien parents, that line hits Clark pretty hard. But Lois promises Roberta that she and Clark will fight for her family and will do whatever they can to expose the identities of the clansmen who attacked them. Encouraged by Lois's confidence, Roberta tells her parents she wants to stay in their new home rather than move back to Chinatown. Besides, on the subject of the identities of the Klansmen, Roberta already has some pretty strong suspicions. While the Klansmen are at her house, Roberta notices one of them is wearing red boots. Red boots just like the ones worn by Chuck, a kid from the neighborhood who is sore at Roberta's brother Tommy for beaning him during a baseball practice. Chuck's Uncle Matt also just happens to be a Grand Scorpion in the Clan of the Fiery Cross. When Uncle Matt escalates the clan's terrorizing of the Lees by abducting Tommy, Roberta gets Jimmy Olsen to take her to Chuck's house, 
where she confronts him and reveals she knows he was one of the Klansmen who came to her house. Chuck gets defensive, pulls out a baseball bat, and is about to wallop Roberta when Superman appears. Chuck, who is wearing a Superman t-shirt and claims to be Superman's biggest fan, is shocked and embarrassed and agrees to help Superman and Roberta find where the clan has taken Tommy, although Chuck doesn't reveal his Uncle Matt's involvement in any of this. Superman rescues Tommy, Jimmy leans on Chuck to find out what else he knows about the clan and their attack on the Lees, but Chuck's not talking. He figures he's already helped out enough by helping Superman find Tommy. Then he goes to see his uncle and learns that Uncle Matt is planning on bombing the Interfaith Community Center where the Lees and a bunch of the other neighborhood kids hang out. Chuck's pending babyface turn still isn't complete. He doesn't call the cops and tell them his uncle is a Klansman who is about to plant a bomb at a community center, but he does ignore Uncle Matt's advice to stay clear and instead runs to the community center and convinces the other kids to come with him to the movie theater. He even starts to make friends with Tommy, owns up to being one of the Klansmen who burned the cross at the Lee's house, and apologizes. Then, finally, after some aggressive final prodding from Roberta, who reminds him of Superman's words, if you might be able to help another person, you should at least try, Chuck tells Roberta and Tommy that his Uncle Matt is the Grand Scorpion of the clan, and that he's planning to do something terrible at the community center. As it turns out, that's only step one of the plan. The clan does bomb the community center, though thanks to Superman and Roberta, Tommy, Jimmy, and Chuck, no one is hurt. But while Superman is busy at the community center, another gang of clansmen, this one including Grand Scorpion Matt himself, attacks the Daily Planet. As Roberta and Jimmy rush to the building on Jimmy's scooter, they see that the planet's iconic rooftop globe has been scarred by a fiery cross. By the time Superman gets there from the community center, the clan has gone and taken hostages with them, including Lois and Perry White. Thanks to a clue left behind by Lois, Superman is able to find them, free them, and deliver the clansmen to police custody. They don't stay in police custody very long, thanks to a cop who is also a member of the clan. Grand Scorpion Uncle Matt goes to visit the Grand Mogul of the clan, like the super-duper tippy-top boss of the whole operation, who helpfully explains the clan's ultimate master plan. It turns out the Grand Mogul is actually Dr. Segret Wilson, Dr. Lee's new boss at the Metropolis Health Department. It also turns out the Metropolis Health Department, despite its official-sounding name, is not a government agency at all, but a private organization. After Superman's fight with Atom Man, Dr. Wilson arranged to take custody of Atom Man to study him and found a way to extract the traces of kryptonite left in his body. Wilson then used that kryptonite to fashion weapons capable of killing Superman, who Wilson sees as the true threat to humanity. Secret Wilson, the Grand Mogul of the Clan of the Fiery Cross, doesn't really care about racial purity or immigration. He's just been using the Clan's hateful message to attract new followers, and then using their membership dues to fund his kryptonite-based weapons research. This doesn't sit right with Grand Scorpion Uncle Matt, so he kills Wilson for being a race traitor, then straps on the kryptonite weapons, strips Wilson of his green clan robe, and heads to the park to kill a bunch of people at a baseball game. He grabs Roberta as a hostage and, wearing Wilson's clan robe but no mask, makes a big speech to the crowd about how the interfaith multicultural community center represents the racial impurity that is destroying America. Chuck has finally had enough and wallops Grand Scorpion Uncle Matt with a baseball bat. Uncle Scorpy doesn't like that, and he turns his big kryptonite bazooka on the kids. But then Superman shows up, and he's worked through his issues and gained all his superpowers by this point, including flight and heat vision, so Matt's in some trouble here. Or is he? The great Scorpini tries to get the crowd to turn on Superman by appealing to their fear and intolerance. A solid move in the United States in 1946. Or, you know, 
any other time. He's like, how can Superman fly? How can he shoot beams out of his eyes? He's not one of you. And Superman says, yeah, you know what? He's right. And he tells the people a few things that he just found out about himself from the visions he's been having of his biological parents. He's from another planet. He came to Earth as a baby. But he's still the same person he's always been. He's still one of them. Not everybody in the crowd sees it that way. A few of them side with Scorpus Malorpus and say, Save us! Send him back where he came from! But Superman saves the day anyway. He overcomes the kryptonite gun with an assist from Roberta, then uses his superpowers to defuse a bomb Scabius Scorpus brought along as a backup plan. The cops re-arrest Uncle Matt, the defrocked hate jock, along with the secret Klansman cop who let him go the first time, and life... Well, it doesn't return to normal, but the characters are able to start adjusting to their new normal. Superman promises to give Lois an interview explaining all about Krypton and why he can fly and shoot lasers out of his eyes now. The kids decide to reschedule their baseball game and just play a pickup game for fun in the meantime. Roberta gets a job as a cub reporter at the Daily Planet, and everyone has to get used to having a Superman who flies. How weird. So that was a very abbreviated plot summary that hopefully, if you haven't read the book, gets across how well the story is able to balance fun superhero adventure fiction with extremely serious real-life issues and character arcs that carry some significant emotional weight. Writer Jean Lu and Yang and artists Guruhiru, and I use the plural because Guruhiru is the name used by a team of artists, Chifuyu Sasaki and Naoko Kawano, find that balance by infusing their story with a stirring, inexhaustible sense of hope. Hope. The story doesn't minimize the threat of hate groups like the Klan, but it does insist that they are threats that can be dealt with and overcome if we are able to see beyond our fear and prejudices and work together. That the creators pull off that balance is even more impressive when you consider that this book is aimed at young readers. Now, I don't have kids myself, and I admit I haven't really felt much like complaining about the fact that over the last few decades, adults have become the target audience for most superhero stories. But when I see how unrelentingly grim so much of DC's output has become, particularly the live-action movies adapted from some of its most popular characters, I do sometimes worry that we've overcorrected. It's nice to find a story like Superman Smashes the Clan that is appropriate for kids, but that also has something important to tell them. And it tells them in a way that is informative, enlightening, but hopefully not too upsetting. A lot of the credit for the book's success belongs to the art by Guruhiru. Superman Smashes the Clan is bold and crisp and brightly colored. It reads like a hybrid of manga and a lushly illustrated children's book. The characters are all sharply drawn and distinctive. Superman wears a variation of his Fleischer Studios costume, which I appreciate. The backgrounds are rendered with an eye for detail, giving every scene a three-dimensional sense of place. And Metropolis itself looks gorgeous. It really feels like the 1940s version of The City of Tomorrow. But going back to the characters, they aren't just well-drawn in terms of the art. Yang's script makes everyone in this story live and breathe. Roberta and Tommy, the young protagonists, feel authentic as siblings. They bicker, they hassle each other, but they also share an unbreakable bond of love and loyalty. As Chinese Americans, the Lees deal with the prejudice they encounter in different ways. Dr. Lee and Tommy try to assimilate, to shrug off the attacks by the Klan and reassure their white neighbors that there's nothing to worry about. Tommy even appropriates some derogatory language to make fun of himself in a self-deprecating way to his new white friends, something that Roberta gives him an earful about later on. Roberta wants to fit in with her new community, too, but unlike her father and brother, she doesn't want to have to deny or disparage who she is in order to do it. 
Roberta's mother, who, like her husband, never gets a first name, unfortunately, finds quiet ways of encouraging her to be herself. When Superman gives Roberta his cape after their first adventure together, Mrs. Lee fashions it into a jacket, which Roberta wears for most of the rest of the story. In the story's final pages, Roberta learns to truly embrace her identity, thanks in part to a gift from Lois Lane. Lois gives Roberta a pen engraved with the initials LL. Thinking them to be Miss Lane's initials and blushing at what an expensive pen it is, Roberta tries to give it back. But Lois tells her that she's done her research, and the LL doesn't stand for Lois Lane, but for Roberta's true name, her Chinese name, Lan Xin Li. While Roberta's character arc is about fighting back against prejudice and taking pride in herself and her background, Chuck's story is about learning to recognize that prejudice as evil and call it by its name, even when it's being propagated by his own family. It takes Chuck almost the entire story to finally fully turn against his Uncle Matt, but Yang doesn't want us to condemn Chuck's reluctance to abandon his violent and bigoted uncle. He wants us to understand it. Even after he helps the others at the community center avoid being hurt in the bombing and confesses to Roberta and Tommy that Uncle Matt is in the clan, Chuck still struggles to salvage some good from the man who, as he says to Tommy and Roberta, has been there for my mom and me ever since we lost my... ever since we needed him. Later on, after trying to find some justification for the clan's actions in another talk with Tommy, Chuck admits, I just want to know that my family's not evil. Chuck's reticence to acknowledge what his Uncle Matt is only makes it all the more impactful when he finally does after Matt shows up at the baseball game. And Chuck makes his stand before Superman arrives to save the day. Good on you, Chuck. It took a little while, but you got there. Chuck's story also plays out in the context of one of the most important of the story's larger themes. The idea that hate groups like the Klan and the fear and intolerance that drive them come from within our communities, not from outside. While the Klan of the Fiery Cross is depicted as having begun operations in Metropolis relatively recently, it certainly hasn't had any trouble finding members from the area. The Klansmen who burn a cross on the Lee's lawn and bomb a community center and take hostages from the Daily Planet are not invaders. They are neighbors. And, except for the relative few members of the Klan who we see arrested, those neighbors and their bigoted attitudes remain once the story is over. Nor is there any indication that the people who turn against Superman after he reveals he is from another planet see the error of their ways. The clan itself may be defeated, but the ignorance and hatred that fueled it remain, a fact of life that must be reckoned with on an ongoing basis. One character besides the Lees, who will have to continue to deal with the racial prejudice embodied by the clan, is Inspector Henderson. He's an important supporting player in the story, and I haven't mentioned him yet because I think he deserves to be highlighted for a few reasons. First of all, the character of Inspector Henderson is a pull from the Adventures of Superman TV series starring George Reeves, which is one of my favorite versions of Superman. You'd better believe there's going to be an episode of this series about that one. Second, while the original Henderson is white, the Henderson of Superman Smashes the Klan is a black man. This makes him a target for the Klan as well, obviously, but it also gives Jean Lu and Yang an opportunity to explore themes of racial injustice from different angles. We see that much of the animus directed toward people of color by the members of the Klan is rooted in resentment. Dr. Lee is seen as undeserving of his position. It's assumed he got his job due to some special consideration related to his race or his status as an immigrant, and therefore took a job that rightfully belongs to a natural-born white American. Inspector Henderson experiences the same thing, but the resentment he faces is amplified by the fact that he not only has a good job, he has a position of authority in the community. 
Henderson is also taken hostage by the Klan, along with Lois and Perry White. And one of the Klansmen makes sure to tell him how sick it makes him having to see Henderson with his police badge on his chest. After the hostage situation has been resolved, Perry White picks up Henderson's badge, which was dropped and mangled during a fight with the Klansman, and hands it back to him. Perry assures Henderson that the police department will replace it and tells him, it's just a badge. It's not what makes you a police officer. Unfortunately, not everyone in Metropolis sees it that way, Mr. White, Henderson says. We know there are racist cops on the Metropolis Police Force. We know at least one is a member of the Klan. And again, this isn't something that is magically fixed by the end of the story. It's something Henderson has to contend with every day of his life. Perry's well-meaning optimism is tempered by Henderson's harsher reality. Henderson has another interaction that highlights an often ignored byproduct of racial intolerance, friction between members of different marginalized groups. Henderson and a couple of his friends are the first to arrive to help put out the fire set by the Klan in the Lee's front yard. Dr. Lee's initial reaction is not one of gratitude, but of anger. He seems to assume that these three black men have come to make trouble, not to help, and tells them to get lost. Even after Dr. Lee realizes Henderson is a cop, he seems more interested in pretending nothing happened than in cooperating with the police to find out who is responsible for the attack on his property and family. He calls the cross-burning a misunderstanding and insists that we just have to show them we're not what they think we are. A rather pointed thing to say with Henderson standing right there. The care taken to make so many of these supporting characters compelling and multifaceted is impressive, but this is a Superman story, and this is a video series about the best versions of Superman, so no matter how much I like it, I wouldn't be talking about this story unless its treatment of Superman was also pretty great. What's noteworthy in this case is how its Superman is great. Superman as Immigrant has been a popular interpretation of Superman for decades. I think it's a very useful interpretation that highlights some of the most appealing aspects of the character, but Superman Smashes the Klan is one of the few Superman stories I have encountered that frames Superman explicitly as an immigrant. Not metaphorically, but literally. His insecurities, his anxieties are the same as those experienced by more earthly immigrants like the Lees. He realizes from a young age that he's not from here, that he's different, and that, in the eyes of many people in his community, different means bad, scary, and unwelcome. One of the reasons Superman becomes such good pals with Roberta is because he relates to her experience in a very direct way. When she says that she feels like she doesn't belong, he knows exactly how she feels. He's been there. Ultimately, Superman finds the courage to accept who he is, where he came from, and to stop trying to hide it from others. Except for the part where he's secretly Clark Kent. But hey, nobody's perfect. He stops hallucinating himself as a green-skinned alien, like the one he saw on the cover of a pulp magazine as a child. His visions of his Kryptonian parents change, too. And through those visions, which turn out to be telepathic messages, he learns about Krypton and how his parents sent him away from their doomed planet so that he might still have a life and a future. Superman, the immigrant, the refugee from a destroyed home. That experience, that identity, is what enables Superman to deliver one of the most eloquent and powerful rebukes to the racism of the Klan that I've ever seen. It comes near the end of his final fight with Scorpius Minimus after he's used his cold breath, for the first time apparently, to safely dispose of Scorpius' suicide bomb. The green score puzzle demands to know why a physically superior being like Superman is lowering himself to defend a family of obvious inferiors like the Lees, and goes on to declare that Superman and the Lees share nothing in common, no blood, no history. There's nothing that binds you together, he says. 
That has been the clan's point all along. A nation bound by nothing cannot last. But we are bound together, Superman says. By the future. We all share the same tomorrow. That even includes you. And then Scorpidorp slashes Superman with a kryptonite knife because there's just no talking to some people. But anyway, what a beautiful rebuttal to the small-minded and short-sighted worldview of men like Uncle Matt there. It's simple and elegant and inarguable. We all do share the same tomorrow. We all help to make tomorrow by what we do today. And we can make that tomorrow more just and peaceful and prosperous and sustainable and inclusive of everyone. Or we can make it more like today. Or worse yet, yesterday. It's up to us. That's the message of Jean Lu and Yang and of the Superman he and Guru Hero have created here. And that message is just one of the many reasons why he's a deserving candidate for the title of Best Superman Ever. Well, the contrived sentence that ends with me saying the title of the series is usually the last line of the video, but in this case, I have two more things to tell you before I go. First, myself and Dana Cole, who you may know as my co-host on our weekly Trek Reluctantly live stream, and as one of my co-stars on the Ensign's Log podcast, recorded a video where we talk about Superman Smashes the Clan, which Dana is also a big fan of, and that video is available right now over on Dana's YouTube channel. There's a link to it in the description, and if you enjoyed this video and you're a fan of Superman Smashes the Clan too, I would love it if you popped over to Dana's channel at some point and checked out that video, because Dana and I had a really good conversation, as, in all modesty, we always do. Second, many of you probably know that Superman Smashes the Clan is inspired by a famous storyline from the Adventures of Superman radio show titled The Clan of the Fiery Cross. That story aired on the radio in 1946, which is why Superman Smashes the Clan is set in 1946. In the next episode of this series, I'm going to talk about that radio story and about the adventures of Superman radio show in general, which introduced Superman to millions of people and shaped the character in profound ways that we still see today. So watch for that video, and I'll tell you all about another version of the character that might just have been the best Superman ever. See? I did it again.